Well, thank you. I'm excited to talk with you all today about the uh, future of our planet, this planet. As far as I'm concerned, this is an ocean planet. I know these are facts that you guys know well, of course, that about two-thirds of our planet is covered in oceans. But if you actually look at it another way and you think about the three-dimensional area, about 90% or in fact 90 plus percent of our planet, uh, the living space on our planet is covered in oceans. So uh, truly a blue marble and truly a defining attribute of our own home are oceans. And of course, the oceans bring us all kinds of values. A lot of you probably have a bunch of these values running through your head right now about what we can take and what we need from the oceans. It's things like jobs for fishing or aquaculture or shipping. It's things like food, our dinner, quite nutritious food that comes from the oceans. And it's also, of course, uh, our own air. We can maybe do an exercise in values from the oceans together, if you will indulge me. Let's take one breath together. Deep one. Exhale. OK, good. Second breath. And exhale. All right, we're all very well centered. And we're already all together sampling. For me, my favorite value, which comes from the oceans, which is oxygen. So as many of you know, about half of the oxygen that we have on our planet is produced by photosynthesis in our global ocean. So we could probably start and end a lecture on the value of the oceans there with that. We all appreciate oxygen. We all appreciate our oceans. So what are some of the threats that are facing the future of our oceans, and how might we face off against some of those threats? I want to talk, um, as was alluded to, I want to talk a little bit about how technology is both an ally and a foe for our oceans. Maybe we can start first by talking about some of the challenges that technology is creating for the health of our global oceans. So technology is helping us, has helped us, become one of the most significant predators to ever roam the oceans, bigger and more powerful than sharks, whales, whatever else you can think of. And if you would sort of zoom back in your head in time and imagine yourself a million years ago talking to another human being um, in a cave or something like that, and you made the suggestion that, hey, our species, human beings, are going to get out and we're going to become the most powerful um, predator in the entire oceans, they probably would have just laughed at you because we're not really built biologically for that. But technology, as I've suggested, has helped us become this big super predator, has helped us take ourselves and our ecological force out into the oceans to harvest in some of the deepest parts of the oceans, to fish and do industry in some of the most remote parts of the oceans. You get a little bit of a sense of that from this scene of industrial fishing. And here's another image of uh, the sort of largesse, if you will, or the magnitude by which um, technology has helped to expand our ecological influence on the oceans through fishing. This is a view of the impact or the influence that uh, a super trawler could have on oceans. We're looking here at the number of semi-trucks that you can fit into the net of a super trawler. You can actually, you don't have to count those, but there are 65,000 semi-trucks represented here that you could put in the uh, net of uh, one of these super trawlers. So you can just get a sense of how far, how deep, and, and how much we're able to take with this new technology that's come to us to help us do um, our own ecological business in the seas. So in many ways, a lot of this new force and this new um, influence that we have on the oceans and on biology in the oceans is relatively new. So a lot of the technology that we developed just after World War II technology that was developed for the purposes of doing war, things like sonar and diesel engines, we repurposed for the purposes of, in some ways, doing war on the oceans, or at least increasing our industrial footprint on the oceans and doing more um, with greater impact and with greater power on the seas than ever before. So another form of technological influence or another way that technology has shaped and is rapidly shaping the future of our oceans is through one of the key uh, um, emission outputs from industry that's fueled and advanced by technology. You guys are looking here at a time series for CO2 emissions over time across our global planet. So as we became more um, advanced in our capacity to do industry, as technology increased our capacity on land and sea to do business, we of course have this key output of CO2. Some of that CO2, um, much of that CO2 is causing our planet, as you know, to become hotter. That CO2 is diffusing into our oceans, because causing our oceans to become more acidic. That heat is changing the uh, level of oxygen in our oceans, sometimes depriving ocean wildlife of oxygen, so creating some grand challenges, in this case, indirectly as a result of technology. 
So bit by bit, as our oceans become busier, as they become more influenced by technology, as they become more influenced by industry that's fueled and advanced by technology, we see, this is just a sort of artist rendition of our changing oceans in parallel with a, a view of changing life and industry and technology and the way that influences our environment on land and sea, we see the potential for a bit of a different kind of future ocean. And again, remember back to the start, if it's a different kind of ocean could mean a different set of values and a different sense of services that are coming to us from this um, so important and uh, truly global ecosystem that shapes our lives every other breath. So, as I suggested, technology shaping our oceans and potentially creating some major and significant challenges for our oceans, but technology also one of our most exciting and our most powerful allies for balancing the influence of some of those challenges that technology is empowering. So I'd like to look at a few of the advantages that you can leverage from technology to promote ocean health. We'll maybe sample a few things that we do in my lab to try to bring in and harness the power of technology to promote ocean health and maybe counterbalance some of the challenges that other forms of technology are creating for this 50, 100 year future of our oceans. I'm gonna start here with a simple utilization of technology, which starts with this whale on one particular day when I was here on campus. It's a Sunday afternoon and I got a call from uh, somebody in the National Park Service and they said, uh, hey Doug, we've got a problem. Um, down in Ventura Harbor, which is south of the coast from campus, they said, we have a little humpback whale that's got way back into the harbor and is totally stuck and can't find its way out. You're a marine biologist, you surely know what to do. And I thought, okay, well, uh, what, what can I do to be helpful? I thought about whales and I thought, you know, that uh, there are essentially two driving forces that shape behavior of whales, as there are two driving forces that shape all kinds of life. In fact, um, a lot of the life for the students in my classes here on campus, um, two driving forces, one of them being food, the other of them being sex. In the case of this whale, it's a little whale, really was probably much more motivated by food than anything else. So I thought, okay, what can I do to harness that biology that's uh, shaping its decision making? I thought, okay, well, I could take a audio recording of whales, humpback whales, that have been f f uh, recorded foraging in other parts of the oceans, go down to the uh, harbor, I did, um, put down a waterproof speaker at the mouth of the harbor and played this recording, a buffet sound, um, sort of buffet open sound, the foraging sound of this uh, humpback whale over and over and over again all night long in this harbor. The whale heard the song and made its way out from this sort of labyrinth in the back of the um, harbor to the mouth of the harbor and on its way to freedom. Now that's a very, very simple use of a simple forms of technology to make a simple bit of influence on ocean health for, in this case, just one whale and a pretty big, and as we have looked at together, challenged ocean. And I thought, well, I wonder with uh, our lab and the smart people and the smart tools in our lab, if there's not something more that we can do to try to help, um, again, build from and draw from the power of technology to do more to promote ocean health. In this particular case, to do more for challenges that are facing endangered marine mammals. So there are many challenges facing marine mammals. Um, one of those, um, in addition to getting stuck in places, which is all things considered relatively minor, a more, much more significant um, challenge for marine mammal health and marine mammal futures is actually collisions with ships. So shipping is growing in our oceans. As our oceans become, again, uh, more commerce in our seas, uh, more industrialized, the highways of our oceans, the shipping lanes in our oceans that crisscross and connect cities across the Pacific, Atlantic, elsewhere, are becoming busier. That increase in commerce means that there's an increase in collisions between wildlife and ships at sea. Marine road kills, if you will, right? And really unfortunate when you have a large um, cruise ship or a, a, a container ship that comes into port that has the largest animal that's ever lived on our planet, blue whale, wrapped around its bow like this, right? And about 80 endangered whales are killed or estimated to be killed up and down the uh, west coast of North America every year as a result of collisions with ship. So we need this commerce, or we, we probably want to maintain this healthy commerce to promote a maritime economy in a place like California to get the kind of products. Everything I'm wearing probably came on one of these container ships and things in my lab, many of them did. So we want to promote or at least sustain that commerce, but we'd like to reduce this conflict between this industry and these important members of a biodiversity portfolio in our oceans. So we thought, well, we're not going to sit out there and uh, play feeding recordings for whales every time one comes by to, to have it navigate around these ships, but maybe we can 
actually tell the ships when there are whales in that space and use technology to try to help detect when whales are present there. So we're working right now, and in fact, next month we'll be deploying with colleagues, colleagues at UC Santa Cruz, colleagues at Wood Hole, colleagues at Scripps, and a system which will be the first near real-time whale detective system in the entire Pacific Ocean here off Santa Barbara. In fact, probably if you had a pair of binoculars, you could see this thing off the coast at Campus Point at UCSB. It'll have a couple different features. One will be a buoy that has a um, hydrophone sitting underwater that's constantly listening for whales, always detecting for ocean noise, including whale sound, sitting aboard to the point of leveraging the power of technology, sitting on board the uh, hydrophone will be a program, uh, uh, some simple artificial intelligence that's filtering out the sound that it's listening for and hearing and recording, and it's auto-processing for sounds, very characteristic diagnostic so uh, songs and sounds that um, match with different whale species. So it can be able to auto-detect, if you will, um, the songs of whales as it's listening there under the sea. And couple that potentially with technology that's looking out at the oceans, thermal cameras that are scanning for the heat signature of hot whales in an otherwise cold ocean. And with, if you look up here at the top, Big data sensing from satellite, satellites that are orbiting around our planet, looking down and collecting data. Um, in this case, they're looking at a bunch of features in the oceans, including the amount of productivity in the oceans, which helps us build models for trying to figure out how much food there is, how much whale food there is, and then eventually forecast, sort of weather forecasts, if you will, for whales that help us predict whether it's going to be a high or a low whale day. And we can kind of seam all the information coming in from this sensor network to, through some decision algorithms, create a signal that tells ships that are operating in that space whether there are whales present, and if they know that, they can um, use evasive behavior. Usually they just slow down. And it's sort of the same kind of uh, advantage for the whales is when we slow down, when schools are in session um, around those schools to make sure that we're operating a little bit more safely for all the kids in schools. This is the same kind of logic and has the same sort of positive benefits for whales in this space when you can plug technology in to help tell you when whales are in that space. Now, let me give you another um, example of ways to uh, piggyback on the power of technology to try to do more, learn more, help more in our oceans. I talked about satellites already. When I was referencing the information you can pull off satellite, satellite systems before, I was thinking more, and we were using more, classic large satellite systems. As probably many of you know, this is a really exciting time for remote sensing of our planet and for satellite technology because we're rapidly building and the world is rapidly deploying large fleets of small micro and nano satellites that are now in low Earth orbit seeing and sensing all kinds of things on our oceans, including all kinds of things um, all, all kinds of things on our planet, including a lot in our oceans, and covering a lot and sensing a lot more ocean space than we were ever able to do even five and, and certainly 10 years ago, which opens up some pretty exciting opportunities, again, to try to manage constructively a healthy future for our oceans. Here's one example of uh, sensing technology and information that you can pull off this small satellite system. I'm showing you here um, detections that came through the satellite array of um, process information from billions of data points that are showing us where fishing vessels are operating in the ocean. So fishing vessels carry these safety sensors. We use um, convolutional neural networks in this collaboration with a, a data scientists at Google and a group called Global Fishing Watch to filter through billions of data points of all kinds of vessels, you know, um, some fishing vessels and shipping vessels and all kinds of vessels that are out there, and to find the diagnostic footprint that tells us that fishing is happening in a space, and then we plot that here. I'm animating that data. I can show you a still frame here where you take um, all the data, um, as I'm doing here from 2016, and put it in space. The really interesting thing about a data plot like this is a data plot looks like a map, but it's actually just a spatially explicit um, uh, representation of data from all of these fishing vessels in a single year. The really fascinating thing for me as an ocean scientist is that uh, in a way you kind of turned on the lights for the oceans. You always wondered where is fishing happening? Now through this uh, data processing and through this satellite sensing you can actually visualize that footprint for fishing on the oceans. It helps you do all kinds of things. And, and by the way, what a footprint, right? Um, again, not a map, but we're actually outlining the borders of the continents with all this data because essentially our global fishing fleets are fishing everywhere across our global oceans except on dry land to give you a sense of the, the significance and the magnitude of this particular industry in our seas. So you can do some pretty practical things besides making interesting data plots. Um, 
for ocean health using this data, using this technology. Here's an example. In this black box up here, on the left, um, I'm showing you a protected area in the ocean. It's kind of like an underwater national park and a quite large protected area, right? This one is just a, close to the size of California. It was set up by the uh, country of Kiribati to protect biodiversity, whales, and other things in this space way out in the Pacific. We first used this sensing technique to look and see where remotely where fishing was happening inside this protected area before they closed this area to fishing and uh, used it as a safe zone for biodiversity and for fish and sort of a savings account, if you will, for their national fisheries. You see lights, lots of lights on inside that box before they closed it, which is sort of what you expect, lots of fishing. You close that in order to keep this uh, set up, the savings account, and put it into business. And six months afterwards, so sort of sitting here in my lab, you know, looking at this data feed as it's coming back to us, you see the lights go off. You see it happily functioning with uh, much of the efficacy, much of the purpose that it was designed for. Uh, much less, almost no fishing inside the protected area after it closed. You actually get some useful intel. Like uh, there are, as you see, a few data points that were in there that uh, are putative fishing that probably shouldn't be in there. And the collaboration we worked with, Global Fishing Watch, they sent that data over to the country of Kiribati, which put it together in an enforcement package and actually fined the vessel that was illegal fishing, illegally fishing in that national park, in that protected area, over a million dollars, and then used that to help with some of their development goals. So kind of cool example of how, you know, hundreds, in fact, thousands of miles away, um, with a fast internet connection, so smart data scientists, as collaborators, you can do some influential things, important things for ocean biodiversity, and people that depend on ocean biodiversity. Another example here, where we're actually gonna pull in fish that we're tracking, and not just fishermen that we're tracking. First, the data in color here, all this plot, is what I just showed you. This is some of that process sensor data. We're zooming in another protected area just north of the region, um, this, uh, this park in Kiribati that I showed you. This is actually a US protected area. And here in the box, you see one of these sensors. Um, this is a simple piece of technology, not too dissimilar at its core than some of the GPS tracking technology in the phones in your pockets. Um, what it allows us to do when you fix this to a shark is, in essence, bring sharks into the Internet of Things, which is to say simply that it allows you to communicate with this device and allows the device to communicate with you and tell you where sharks are, any of the sharks that you tagged, in the ocean, which lets the shark in um, effect through its behavior and uh, uh, its position in the oceans tell you what space it needs, what resources it needs, what part of the oceans are most um, important to it ecologically. So you can actually combine, as we're doing here, the white uh, dots are darts that uh, are the transmissions from uh, about a dozen sharks, and all the other data, as I said, uh, the data from the other big predator in the oceans, the new big predator in the oceans, people. So you have sharks and people. When you put that data together in space, you can become a much more intelligent zone, a zoner, a manager, for thinking about how to manage the impact and the overlap between what sharks need and what people need and um, where they operate in space, which matters in a lot of situations where you have endangered sharks or where you want to manage relationships between what sharks need and what people need. So another simple example of how you can apply technologies usefully for ocean health. Now, not all fish are easy to get a transmitter on. Um, this is one that I really wanted to put a transmitter similar to this on, but for potentially obvious reasons, this fish kept beating me time and time again every time I, I tried to catch it to put a transmitter on. It's really big. It's uh, about 500 pounds, 250 kilograms, a giant sea bass. Um, you could find it, uh, if you were lucky, right here again off UCSB in some of the kelp forests. Um, and it's an endangered species, critically endangered, about as endangered as uh, some of our most endangered rhinoceros, right? And, and incre incredibly charismatic and, as I, as I mentioned, an incredibly powerful fish. Now, when I was getting sort of frustrated by not being able to uh, wire up this um, giant sea bass, sort of looking around the internet to try to get some more thoughts about the fish, where it's found, what people are doing with this fish, and realized that actually this fish had been caught many, many, many times, and not with a hook and a line by fishermen, but by photographers that were every bit as enamored by the uh, large size and the charisma of the fish that I was. So these are just, this is a mosaic of hundreds of photos of uh, giant sea bass that I'm just putting here in space. When I looked at image after image of this, we realized that there was something we could really use. In fact, undergraduates here at UCSB made this discovery that these giant sea bass are carrying a unique pattern 
uh, of spots, which operate a lot like a fingerprint for the giant sea bass. So there are all these pictures out there which were revealing their fingerprints. We could then characterize the spot pattern there. And that to make the process more efficient, um, we could actually try to match up fish and their spots across all of these photos using, again, um, some simple machine learning. This is an algorithm that was developed for spot matching, but not for spots on giant sea bass, for spots in the sky. It was an algorithm that was developed by astrophysicists that were trying to identify different constellations in, um, in telescope uh, images, it was used actually on the Hubble telescope or data from the Hubble, tel Hubble telescope. But we repurposed the algorithm to try to identify our endangered fish in this citizen science program. We actually built a, what we sometimes call a Facebook for fish, I might rebrand that to something else besides a Facebook of fish. But anyway, a citizen science site where people could upload their um, images, and then we could do the spot matching, and then learn a lot of valuable information about their biology, where these endangered fish were going, how they were using protected areas, where they were breeding, and things like that. So the kind of core information that a marine biologist like myself would want to have and didn't have when you're thinking about how to manage their future and their role in our ocean ecosystems. So. Pretty exciting example of, uh, again, using technology to learn more about our oceans. Let me give you one last example of using technology to try to help promote ocean health. We talked about um, using technology to help with existing industries in the oceans like shipping, how to um, help make uh, the impact of fisheries that are already well established, in fact, hundreds of years old, like fishing, smarter and better for ocean health and human health as it depends on oceans. You can also use technology to try to consider if and how you want to onboard new technology-driven industries that have not yet begun in the oceans. And this is one. These are machines. Uh, they're, in effect, 300-ton waterproof robots that companies are designing to consider start to start mining in the oceans. You would send these down in the oceans, actually, in pursuit of uh, minerals like this, or at least um, rocks like this, which are full of a variety of different minerals including minerals like cobalt. Um, I'm showing you here a, a trade flow um, diagram for the amount of trade volume changing over time um, across our planet. And you'll see as we move forward into the 2000s, closer to the here and now, the uh, strength of those lines goes up and up and up because we're um, increasing our demand for some of these minerals, minerals like cobalt, which are really important, again, for technology, things like components in my phone and components in my laptop. And there is cobalt in these rocks. There is cobalt in the oceans, which has companies beginning to think about whether they want to start, for the first time ever, this new industry of mining in the oceans. You probably can imagine there's some challenges, and uh, that maybe I stay up late at night worrying about some of these challenges for machines like I showed you going in and doing business in the oceans. Um, some obvious challenges. Back up here, I'll show you one obvious challenge. Oh, we're going to animate this because it's too cute not to animate. Okay, one obvious challenge is that when you face off with some of the really special biodiversity that's down in some of the spaces where people are proposing to mine, um, a machine like the kind that I showed you versus the octopus, the octopus is not going to win, and this is a, a, um, a very unique, brand new species. Social media sort of labeled it the Casper octopus. Shortly after it was discovered, it was found to breed on some of these rock nodules, which um, miners were considering extracting. There are many such species found nowhere else on our planet that are down in the space we're considering mining. And more importantly, there are many ecologically important species, and there's some conflicts that could arise from mining. Um, for example, creating large underwater um, dust clouds, which could interact with those fisheries that we saw have such an important footprint, an extensive footprint on our oceans. So where's the plug-in for technology? Well, the same way that you can use some of these neural net models and simple algorithms to try to process data for uh, creating a footprint for fishing, you can do the same for creating a footprint for mining in the oceans. The red lines that are coming online here are showing you uh, using an adapted algorithm where mining exploration is beginning in the seas. This mosaic of uh, squares here is a mining claim area in the Pacific Ocean that uh, from east to west is about the same width as the continental US. And, uh, what we're doing here is just sharing information um, through this uh, uh, data transparency and data tracking project about where some of this mining exploration is happening with the notion and the hope that uh, data can be very empowering and enlightening. 
If you had somebody who was thinking about starting mining in a public park in your own neighborhood, you'd probably want to get involved, and you probably would get involved in conversations about if and how that mining should start. These ocean spaces are, in many ways, your own backyard park, too. These are high seas areas that uh, the rocks down there, the octopus down there, the future of this space um, is an international common good. It belongs to you, belongs to me, belongs to all of us, because it is in international waters. And so this data can help more people know about this industry, get engaged in this industry. And I think when more people get engaged in conversations, then you have higher IQ solutions. So another example of how data and thoughtful use of data can promote transparency, promote sound decision making for an ocean future. All right, so a handful of examples of how you can um, use technology as an ally to offset or to balance out some of the challenges that technology itself is creating for the future of ocean health. I hope we're all on board from the start of the talk that ocean ecosystems certainly are home to some fabulous biodiversity, some inspirational, beautiful, charismatic um, biodiversity from octopus but whales, but they're also core for providing those key services like food. And not just food for one tomorrow, but for a hundred tomorrows and jobs and, um, and inspiration and, and, of course, our own breaths. So, I think it's a very exciting moment ahead of us in marine science um, to be able to constructively pull in the power of new technologies to promote the long-term health of this big blue planet and the ocean ecosystems um, that define it. Um, you know, probably a lot of you uh, have thought of marine biologists as being people that run around with uh, red beanies on and red wine and, and things like that. Um, and not a lot of technology. Um, sometimes people do still run around with red beanies and red wine on, but we use pretty sophisticated technologies these days. We're moving up from, say, uh, duct tape and zip ties to using and leveraging the power of things like drones and satellites and big data processing to get to and safeguard a healthier future for our planet. And there's probably no better place, at least no better place I can think of, than UC Santa Barbara that uh, has lots of smart technology and lots of smart people to try to put those two things together to help look after the future of our ocean planet. Glad to field any questions that you guys have. Thank you.